Well, my name is Paul Greenwald, and I was born in Paris, in France, on the 9th of March, 1933. My family was not terribly observant. My mother came from a very observant family. My father's family was not very observant. My father had lost his mother when he was 10 years old, so he was brought up by a grandmother. Uh, in France, we, up to the war, we kept, uh, you know, we basically observed all the Jewish laws up, up to the war. But during the war, my mother just threw everything out and uh, did not be, didn't, was not religious after the war. She, she just gave up religion altogether during the war. Uh, my parents were really poor because, as I said, my father was a baker and he had long periods of unemployment up to about 1937 when the socialist government came to power and improved conditions in France. Uh, but up to then he had very long periods of unemployment. Well, it basically ch changed in 1940 when the Germans marched into Paris. Uh, restrictions were, by mid October, I think we had restrictions such as you know, not being able to go to cafes, restaurants, not being able to go to movies. Uh, but the, apart from that, seeing that my parents were never wealthy, most of it did not really affect them. Uh, didn't affect me either, except for one thing. Uh, when I went, I used to, I used to love reading as, as a child, and I used to belong to the municipal library. And as I went up one day to the municipal library, I was about eight years old, the Germans had already been in France for over a year. Uh, the librarian asked me, are you Jewish? And I said, yes. So I said, oh, we don't want Jews here. And she tore up my membership card in the waste paper bin and told me to, to leave. That was the first item that were felt uh, that I was being discriminated against. Shortly afterwards, we had to wear the uh, yellow star with the name, with the word Juif, which is Jew printed on it. And I remember the first day I went to school, and I was still going to school then, uh, lots of children sort of came around me and looked at it, wondering what it was. When we went up to this classroom, the teacher said, you will notice that today a number, because a number of children are wearing stars. I want you to make sure that you do not discriminate against them. If they were your friends yesterday, they should remain your friends today and tomorrow. And anyone who's going to discriminate against those children will have to deal with me. So that was quite courageous of her to say that, because she too could have been dismissed from the but as far as I know, nothing happened to her, because shortly afterwards I had to leave school, didn't get back till three years later, and she was still there. So I assumed that nothing happened to her. Uh, Jewish men started to be picked up in May 1941. Uh, my father managed not to be picked up. Being a baker, he worked at night, so when they came to call for him, he wasn't home. Uh, and when it became a bit, too, uh, too dangerous for him to walk the streets, he smuggled over to the south of France where my mother had a sister living there. Uh, then in July 1942, police went around and stopped the Jews in the streets. And I remember being stopped two or three times when I was walking with my mother. And they said that all they said is don't stay at home on the 16th of July. So my mother made arrangements not to stay in her apartment that night. My mother went down to the caretaker of the building. Uh, all buildings in France had a caretaker and said to her, would you let us down into the cellar to spend the night in the cellar? She was the only one who had the key to the cellar and she agreed. She said, OK, I'll let you down as long as the Germans don't ask to go down there, you'll be safe. If they ask to go down there, I'll have no option but to let, let them go. The next morning, we heard knocking on the front gate with 
and then heavy footsteps the, the staircase was a wooden staircase just above the cellar heavy footsteps a lot of commotion went on for a couple of hours and then everything quietened down and she came down and said right the germans have gone now uh, or the police i think it was mainly french police not germans that they've gone now i would suggest you go back to your apartment stay there and i'll bring food every day. Now we couldn't get out because we had to wear the yellow star and all our neighbours knew that we were Jews and somebody could have seen us. If somebody would have seen us without the star, they could have reported us. So we stayed in our apartment for about two weeks until she came up with two girls. But girls were about 25 I would say. They were people smugglers. There was lots of barbed wire that we had to crawl under. Uh, some places were, for, were forested so we could walk, otherwise we had to crawl. A couple of times we heard motorcycles, and every time we heard a motorcycle, we all laid flat on, on the grass. Luckily, they never saw us. The grass was high, uh, they never saw us. We all got across and we ran to a part which, were, which was wooded, a wooden part we could stand up and we looked back and we saw my mother lying there with a cord under the barbed wire. We were deciding what to do and suddenly a man appeared, he appeared out of nowhere. He was tall, uh, he had long red hair to his waist, a long bushy beard to his waist, he wore a cape around his shoulders, uh, that was the hottest part of the year. And he had a long staff or stick in his hand, with, you know, like, like, like prophets, you usually see, see them with round. He unhooked my mother, uh, walked out towards us, and he said, what are you doing here? And the girls explained to him. So he said, follow me. So we followed him for about another two hours, sometimes again crawling under barbed wire and walking, sometimes crawling, sometimes walking. And then he stood up and he said, right, you're in unoccupied France now. And he just disappeared, just walked away, disappeared. My mother always said it was an angel sent by heaven to save us. <laughs> we're all, all very worried, or the, you know, we're all very worried that uh, we'd get caught. We were lucky, we got across. The girls took us to the next village. We were reunited, my father, I think the next night. That was the 5th of August, 1942. On the 11th of November, 1942, the Germans occupied the whole of France. So we were back where we started, except for two exceptions. One, my parents never registered as Jews, so we never registered there as Jews, and we never wore the yellow star. My parents then thought that, that was before they got false papers, that as, if they get picked up, they would get arrested. But if we were somewhere else, we would be reasonably safe. So they said to, so they, they put us on a farm. <laughs> they put me and my sister on a farm and they paid for us being on the farm. Now, we didn't go to school, so we worked. Uh, if there was no work in the fields, we'd, we'd go, uh, we'd take the animals, it was about a dozen animals, I think there were two cows, a few sheep, a few goats, we'd take them about a kilometre away to the river. So we, we stayed there for about 10 months, or close to a year. Now we were there for as long as my parents could pay. When my parents could not pay anymore, uh, they said, take the children back, we don't want them. So we stayed with them a few months, 
And then one day I was outside and I saw French, French police arriving in cars, several cars of French police, and jumping out right in front of her building. We lived on the ground floor and there were, uh, it was a long corridor with two shops either way. Uh, one of the shops was a butcher. I ran into my mother and I said, <coughs> French police have just arrived. So she grabbed myself and my sister, wanted to leave the building, but the police were at the entrance, <coughs> excuse me, and said, sorry, nobody leaves the building. So we went back, and as we went back, the butcher's wife opened the back door to, into the kitchen, which was, there was a little courtyard, and we were at the, in the back building. So the, she closed the shop, locked the shop up, uh, pulled down all the blinds, and said, don't move, stay here. The police knocked on the door after a while, but she wouldn't open, said nothing. She wouldn't open the door. It was about two in the afternoon when they came, till eight o'clock. Every now and then they knocked on the door. Uh, about eight o'clock, a neighbor knocked on the door and said, look, the police have left. She said, I, I, I know you're there, she said. The police have left, I would suggest you get out because they may come back with reinforcements or they may come back with Germans, get out. So the butcher's wife said, look, you two, to my parents, get out first. I'll bring the children along a little bit later because the children don't need identity cards. I've, my identity cards are okay. We'll get through. But if you get picked up, the children get picked up as well if they come with, with you. So my parents agreed to that. Now, my uncle had bought a hut. It was just a one-room hut with a tiny kitchen in the country. So my parents said, we'll go there and she'll take us out there. When we got there, there was no one there. Uh, there was no light, nothing there. So I suggested she takes us to a neighbour. and neighbour was about 100 metres away. She took us to the neighbour, who took us in, uh, gave us a blanket for my sister and myself to lie on the, to go and to sleep on the floor. She went back. We spent the night there. I couldn't sleep. I didn't know where my parents were. I was afraid that, that they'd been arrested. I uh, didn't know. Comes the morning, my uncle turns up. He went to see, he went to the hut there. There was no one there. So he, he went to the neighbours, found that they knew anything. We were there. I said, where are my parents? He said, he has, he does know. So I decided I'll go back. I walked back to the tram terminus. I took, I think I took the tram into town. Walked up to the people who they were supposed to be. They lived on the third floor. I walked up to the third floor. And before I started knocking on the door, I started crying. I was 10 years old at the time. I started crying. I knew that if my parents were not there, I would never see them again. I couldn't bring myself to knock on the door. So I walked down the stairs. There was a bomb there at the building a few doors away. I stood there for a while till I was able to stop crying. Walked back again. And before I started, before I got to knocking, I started crying again. And I did that three times. <laughs> you know, finally, I knocked on the door and the people opened the door, my parents were there. So we all then went back to that hut and that's where we stayed the rest of the war. Well, once the war was finished, uh, my parents left my sister and I again with a family in Lyon and they went back because we had nowhere to live in Paris. Our apartment was occupied by someone who had taken it back in 1942 and that was already 1945. Uh, so they had to go to court to get the apartment back, which they did and which they got the, they got the, the people occupying it, got the, the eviction order that they had to give us back our apartment not till October 45 that we again reunited with my parents. 
uh, and went back to school. We came on the on the old uh, troop ship and uh, no ship, very ba very bad conditions on the ship. Uh, I was seasick. It took eleven weeks from Marseille to Sydney, and I was seasick during the whole lot of the eleven weeks. No. The only time I, I wasn't seasick is when I was in port. We were in port. Otherwise, I was seasick all the time. My father had a brother living in Melbourne from before the war, and uh, we went to live with him for a few months until my father, my Two of my uncles, my father had a brother and an uncle here from before the war, lent him a sum of money to buy a little bakery in Carlton. So my father bought a bakery and started working on his own.